The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Meeting the Imperative for Improved Cancer Screening Through Multi-Cancer Early Detection Testing, What's My Role as an OBGYN Provider? Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash EQC 860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello, and welcome to Meeting the Imperative for Improved Cancer Screening. I'm Dr. Eric Klein from the Glickman Urological and Kidney Institute at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Mark Shaheen from Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia to join me in this program. Today, we're going to focus on the challenges of current cancer screening and highlight how blood-based multi-cancer early detection tests can address several unmet needs in the early detection of cancer and how these tools can potentially challenge and change how OBGYN providers and oncologists work together in a team-based fashion. During this program, we will periodically share several resources that can reinforce the main take-homes, our discussion on MSED testing. So please take a moment to download these practical tools before we get started. Let's begin. Mark, why don't I turn things over to you to talk about screening and what the role of OBGYNs are in that process. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on this panel and provide this information. As uh, many of you well know, uh, the estimates for new cancer cases as well as deaths in 2022 pertinent to an OBGYN includes uh, roughly 43,000 women um, uh, with breast cancer, uh, 12,800 roughly patients with uh, ovarian cancer, and 12,550 cases of uh, uterine corpus cancer. I would be remiss to um, not include also colon and rectal cases, uh, which are about 70,000 cases in women, as well as lung cancer, 118,000 cases roughly. Uh, these are going to be the top five diseases we are concerned with. We do all understand that early diagnosis can really improve survival, but many of our cancers that we face are often detected at later stages. Um, as a general uh, information, five-year cancer-specific survivals for all cancers when patients are diagnosed early uh, the five-year survival is about 89%. Um, this number can diminish when the cancer is diagnosed late uh, down to 21%. In the case of lung cancer specifically, the difference is 56% versus 5%. So one of our goals as practicing OBGYNs is to detect common cancers such as breast, colorectal, lung um, to avoid the um, patients facing um, advanced metastatic disease. We have a number of screening tests that uh, comes to us through various societies and guidelines, and we practice these every day. For example, for breast cancer, we utilize self-examination, uh, clinical exams, mammography, ultrasound, and MRI. And we advocate that our patients begin screening around age 40 or possibly earlier if additional risk factors are present. They often perform these tests every one to two years. With cervical cancer, we had pap smears for many years, and now we have the additional high-risk HPV screening. And we have... Uh, introduced this screening starting at age 21. Um, the primary HPV test can actually be offered every five years. If the primary HPV testing is not feasible, the test can be combined with a pap smear and be repeated um, every three to five years, depending on the specifics. And I also want to emphasize that for colorectal cancers, uh, we do now advise patients to begin screening at age 45, according to the new guidelines. And this can be done using immunohistochemical tests uh, done on the feces annually, stool DNA test, 
And then there is the option of colonoscopy, sigmoidoscopy, or CT colonography. And those are the various tests that can be offered. The women's cancers continue to really represent an ongoing challenge for every practicing OBGYN. And an assessment of four women's cancers, specifically breast, cervix, ovarian, and uterine cancer, uh, looking through multi-year assessment showed that there is increased incidence, death, and disability adjusted life year associated with female breast cancers. And in most regions, especially in developing countries, cervical cancer was the second most common woman's cancer um, identified. So what is the role of the gynecologist during a a visit and specifically when it comes to cancer screening. Obviously, during a clinic visit, a gynecologist can uh, perform uh, breast cancer screening by examination and also ordering a mammogram plus minus an ultrasound, perform a pap smear for cancer of the cervix as well as HPV test screening, and uh, finally, a stool test can be offered for screening colorectal cancer. However, there is no standard screening available in 2022 for ovarian and endometrial cancers. For some of our higher risk patients or those who have symptoms that suggest one of these cancers, we can certainly start a workup with ultrasound, blood work, and other tests but none of these have been proven to be a good screening test for our cancers. There are ways to increase cancer screening in the United States. Certainly, increasing insurance coverage would assist with this, ensuring that the patients actually have a regular source of medical care. Um, if they're provided with recommendations from healthcare providers to pursue these screening tests and um, are uh, value-based systems actually may reward quality metrics that uh, help to encourage our patients to get uh, screened. Uh, we do have to uh, use the opportunity to harness our electronic medical records to remind clinicians of the necessity for screening. Uh, we use screening navigators, and we also implement evidence-based messaging uh, both through direct messaging to patients and broad public health campaigns to bring in patients and remind them to screen. Finally, there is um, research that could be targeted to improve cancer screening rates. Um, at this point, the percentage of cancers in the United States that cause fatalities that are screened uh, routinely is about 44%, and we could certainly improve on that. Eric, I turn it over to you if you could maybe elaborate on the utility and the science behind the blood-based multi-cancer early detection test at this point. Thanks, Mark. I'm happy to review the clinical science and the underlying biologic science for this exciting new field of multi-cancer early detection. I'll be discussing the clinical data from some of the clinical trials that you see on this slide. Let's talk first about liquid biopsy. On the left, you see a cartoon suggesting that cancer cells produce a number of analytes that can be uh, detected in the blood. And this, in fact, has been known for several decades. It's possible using technology called next generation sequencing, which is the same technology that was used to sequence the entire human genome to detect a cancer signal from the background of all the normal DNA that circulates in our blood. And the opportunity for a blood test to serve as a biopsy could be used across the whole cancer continuum. So we're going to be talking about screening today, but this sort of technology could also be used for cancer diagnosis, for staging and prognosis, for monitoring patients for minimal residual disease, and in choosing targeted therapy for patients with known mutations. It's quite exciting. There are four key concepts for understanding how multi-cancer early detection tests work. The first is that MSET is based on a common cancer signal. So whether you have a cancer from the lung or the liver or the uterus or the ovary, there is cancer-related DNA that can be detected by its methylation pattern uh, that indicates the presence of a cancer. 
The second thing is that MSET is not about finding a particular type of cancer. These are meant to screen um, healthy individuals who are at risk for cancer for all cancers um, that might occur in a particular population. And I'll show you one particular test that in a clinical study found more than 50 different kinds of cancers. Third, MSED should not be compared to tests that screen for individual cancers. That's not what they're intended to do. They're not intended to replace colonoscopy or mammography. And as you see on the bottom, the fourth important point, therefore, is that MSEDs are intended to be used alongside currently approved screening tests. And it's important when you discuss MSEDs with your patients that they understand that this is not meant as a replacement for other screening tests. So let's talk about some of the published clinical data. This was the DETECT A study sponsored by a company called Thrive, where 10,000 women at risk for cancer because of their age and no current or previous uh, known cancer had a blood test. And in those who had a positive signal suggesting cancer in the blood, they had a PET CT scan to see where the cancer might be. And these are the high level results. Uh, overall, 26 cancers were detected, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when you compare that to the number of cancers detected by standard of care screening alone, colonoscopy, low-dose CT for lung, pap smear, and uh, mammography, it actually doubled the number of cancers detected in this particular population. What's also impressive, as you see on the bottom left, is the number of cancers that were stage one or two. About 30% of the cancers were caught in early stages which, as Mark showed you, is the key to curing cancer, which is capturing it before um, metastases occur. So this is the clinical workflow for NSAID tests that will be in the clinic, and I'll be telling you about another one in a moment. You have a patient who's being screened for cancer. They have a liquid biopsy, meaning they have a simple blood draw. The blood is sent off to the lab to be sequenced and analyzed, and then machine learning algorithms analyze the DNA signals in the blood and give us two readouts. The first readout is the presence of a cancer signal or not. So is there cancer present or not? And then the second readout is for those who had a positive cancer signal using some tests, not all, but the one I'm going to tell you about is Grail's gallery test. The site of origin or the type of cancer can be predicted from the blood test. So we get two readouts from the blood, the presence or absence of cancer, and if cancer is present, a predicted likelihood that the cancer comes from a particular organ system. And you can sort of intuitively understand how that can help uh, a workup. And this is what a report might look like. Again, I'm talking about Grail's gallery test, which is the only MSED test that is commercially available currently. And here you see a cancer signal detected report for an individual who's thought to have head and neck cancer and so the idea would be to refer this individual to an ENT surgeon for an evaluation and endoscopy, CT scans, and that sort of thing. But notice that there's a second site prediction there, lung cancer. Because there's a shared cancer signal, sometimes the blood test can't tell with 100% accuracy, although I'll show you the accuracy is very high, can't tell with 100% accuracy where the uh, organ of the cancer origin is. So if the head and neck workup were negative, the next step would be to do a lung CT scan. So let's look at some published data from uh, Grail's gallery test. We did one large study called CCGA, which was divided into three parts. And the part that I'm gonna show you, CCGA3, was the clinical part where we detected, excuse me, where we examined um, a large population of individuals, about 5,000 individuals who were not known to have cancer to determine the performance characteristics of this MSED. And what we can see here is that this blood test found more than 50 kinds of cancers. The false positive rate was less than 1%. That's really important for a screening test that's intended for widespread use. The accuracy in predicting the location of the cancer was 89%. And really importantly, the, the sensitivity for stages one to three cancers, early cancers, that uh, represent about two-thirds of the cancers that uh, cause cancer death in the U.S. was 68%. So what we expect to see with use of these tests is a stage shift to earlier stage disease, which should improve the cure rate. We then went on to do another study called the Pathfinder study, which was a prospective study where we took uh, 6,000 healthy individuals who were not known to have cancer or had some additional risk factors, prior smoking, 
um, a genetic syndrome like BRCA or had been treated for a visceral cancer at least three years before and were, had no evidence of disease. And unlike CCGA3, we took the blood, we got the result, and we returned the results to both the provider and the physician to understand how physicians would respond in terms of directing a diagnostic workup, to understand how long it would take to come to a conclusion about who had cancer, and to understand what cancers this test would find. And again, these are the very high-level studies. Like the DETECT-A study, Cancer was found in a minority of individuals, and that's what we expect in the normal healthy population. So we found cancer, or a cancer signal, I should say, in about 1.5% of individuals, and you can see where the cancers were, many of which fell outside standard of care screening. And on the right side, you see the more impressive results. Again, 40% of the cancers detected by this blood test were stage 1 or 2, and 72% of the cancers that were detected uh, were cancers that don't have standard screening. And what Mark um, alluded to was the fact that although we screen for five cancers in the United States, 600,000 people a year still die from cancer. And the reason that they die is that the standard screening tests we use don't find the kind of cancers that these kind of blood tests can find. So you can see where the excitement is coming from for this. And then if we can compare the performance characteristics of this blood test that was used in both CCGA3 and in Pathfinder, we can see that just as we predicted at CCGA3, the blood test performed almost identically in Pathfinder, a less than 1% false positive rate. In fact, the final data suggests about a half percent positive, false positive rate, a 45% positive predictive value, and in fact, close to 90% um, accuracy in predicting where the cancer might be. We then looked to see how long it took for people who had a uh, positive test or a false positive test to come to a conclusion that yes, I have cancer and this is what it is and I'm gonna go, go on and be treated or it was a false positive. And we know that for all the tests that we use, there are false positives. In fact, if you look at just at the five um, currently recommended screening tests, there are about 8 million false positives a year. So it's not a small number and blood tests the screen for cancer are also going to have false positives. So what you see on the right is that even though this study was done in the middle of COVID when access to testing and care was restricted, it took on average about three months for individuals who had a cancer signal detected and turned out to have cancer to be diagnosed. It's my belief that in the absence of COVID when access to care is not restricted that that workup time is going to shorten significantly. And for individuals who had false positive results, it took a little longer to come to the conclusion that, in fact, the test was a false positive. These, this uh, outlines uh, what sort of diagnostic testing people had. So one of the downsides, again, of any screening test, for example, a mammography that shows a uh, breast mass then has to be referred for a biopsy to figure out whether or not it's cancer just because you have a blo positive blood test that suggests the presence of cancer, that doesn't make a diagnosis. So testing is appropriate, and even patients who have false positives end up getting tested. So what's important here is you can see that almost all the testing was image-based, and it was only the individuals who had abnormalities on imaging that actually got a biopsy or an endoscopy. And most of the diagnostic procedures were done were non-surgical, and it was only in a few patients where surgery was done not to cure the cancer, but to actually make the diagnosis. And what's really important is on the right-hand part of the slide at the very bottom, is that only 2%, in fact, that was only one patient who had a false positive ended up having a minor surgical procedure to make a diagnosis. So I just wanna conclude before we move to some case discussions uh, by sharing an illustrative case. This was an individual who, had, uh, who was over 60, no prior cancer, non-smoker, no genetic predis predisposition to cancer, um, participated in uh, one of our studies and had a positive cancer signal detected. And uh, you can see that CSO, which st stands for clinical site of origin prediction, was predicted to be a colon or rectal tumor. And CSO2, the second one was an upper GI tract tumor. So on day one, the signal was detected. On day four, the results were communicated. On day seven, very quickly, the patient got a CT scan. And uh, about a month later, the patient was referred to GI because the CT scan was negative. 
and the GI physician recommended um, an upper endoscopy, a colonoscopy, and I think they found on the upper endoscopy a benign polyp to begin with. Uh, but um, after that, the patient sat down with the physician and said, okay, my CT was negative, my endoscopy was negative, and yet I still have this blood test that suggests I have cancer. Shouldn't we be looking a little harder? And happily they did because the patient had an endoscopic ultrasound. And as you see on the image in the right, the patient turned out to have an early stage cancer of the small intestine. Now there's no screening test that exists currently that would find a cancer of the small intestine. And certainly um, if this patient had just had routine medical care without this blood test, they would have presented with um, symptoms of an advanced cancer. So that shows you the power of a simple blood test to detect the kind of cancers that we're not detecting currently. So, so let's move on to some illustrative case discussions now so we can illustrate the potential utility of MSEDs and again emphasize that these are meant to be an adjunct to current screening. So here's our first case, a 62-year-old woman, former smoker, 10 uh, pack years, uh, had hormone therapy after menopause, is obese, has a family history of breast cancer and has not been compliant with mammography, and nor has she been compliant with her colonoscopy. So she comes to see you, her OBGYN, for her routine OBGYN care, but we want you to start thinking about what the role of, what your role is in recommending screening. And so I'll turn things over here to Mark to comment on that. Sure, thank you, Eric. So in the context of a routine visit for this patient, I would consider a thorough pelvic examination that would also include a rectovaginal exam, and uh, it should signify any sizable pelvic pathology. Looking specifically at the characteristics that were described here, uh, being that uh, she does have a family history of uh, breast cancer, uh, I would certainly want to advise her to uh, obtain a mammogram uh, for screening. Um, I would also want to dig a little bit more into the breast cancer family history and see whether she is an individual who would uh, qualify for uh, BRCA testing. Um, the algorithms are out there in NCCN, uh, certainly, and can be reviewed, um, but those are opportunities that I would discuss with the patient. Finally, because the patient has not had a colonoscopy ever, um, I would at least uh, start by uh, fecal blood test uh, in the office. Um, I would recommend that she would uh, have a consultation with a GI physician and uh, maybe perform a colonoscopy. Um, if she is not uh, willing to do that, uh, an alternative, which would be a DNA testing on the stool, should be considered. What about, what about screening for ovarian cancer? What's the current status of that? That's a real good question. And um, at the moment, uh, we don't have any recommended screening for ovarian cancer. If you look at risk factors for ovarian cancer um, on this slide, um, age, strong family history of breast and ovarian cancer, inherited mutations such as those in BRCA1, BRCA2, and Lynch syndrome should be considered as uh, potential patients with higher risk factor. Personal history of breast cancer, um, and then um, a few other uh, factors such as endometriosis or history of uh, pelvic inflammatory disease. We do recognize that our pelvic exams in combination with transvaginal ultrasound and CA-125 test may be the best that we can offer a patient. Um, however, we have to also recognize that there is a high prevalence of false positive results, and it's very difficult to either reassure or even provide a concern to a patient just based on those factors. What uh, I would uh, wanna do if there is a, a concern about screening for ovarian cancer, uh, I would have a conversation with the patient and discuss that ovarian cancer is very difficult to detect. Uh, we often identify it in an advanced stage. 95% uh, of the deaths are occurring in those women who are 45 years or older. Uh, the symptoms are often nonspecific, and there is a recommendation that if patients have nonspecific GI symptoms, that they should pursue actually 
uh, a conversation with their gynecologist about um, whether there is a concern for ovarian cancer. At the moment, U.S. Preventative Task Force um, has a D recommendation for ovarian cancer screening. So certainly we're not actively looking for this. And even in the high-risk patients, the conventional screening modalities have not really increased to a dec or has not led to a decrease in mortality. So we live in a frustrating situation with these uh, with this disease. Yeah, so the question is, can MSED screening potentially change this paradigm? And I believe the answer is yes. I didn't show you the data, but in CCGA3, um, the uh, MSED that we used detected 60% of stage one and two ovarian and pancreatic cancers. And so if that were to be validated in larger prospective studies, which we're working on, that would really be a game changer. So should NSAID testing be considered alongside standard screening for patients over 50 and high-risk subgroups? I think the data suggests yet, but um, we're not ready to do that in prime time yet. There's more data and more understanding of how these tests work, but I see that as the future. And then the last question is, what's the ideal timing for MSED testing? And we don't really know the answer to that yet because each cancer has a different, what we call dwell time in terms of when it starts and when it becomes clinically manifest. So right now we're thinking once a year is going to be the appropriate timing for that, but more data will be coming out about that particular issue. In the big picture, um, ultimately these tests are going to be intended to be used again along alongside standard screening tests in the general population over age 50 who are um, at risk for cancer. So I'll turn this back to Mark to put the MSED use in context for practicing OBGYNs. So if we go back to our patient, the 60 year old who uh, presented uh, for that visit, um, we had a patient who essentially had uh, no significant symptoms, um, but a hint of a family history, um, you know, um, in this situation, um, we would uh, discuss that the positive result can really um, point to the likely source, and then maybe we can investigate that uh, further. Um, so blood was taken from the patient, and uh, she agreed to screening, and MSIT screening was performed. The screen comes back positive and suggests actually the origin to be an ovary. And this patient uh, would be then referred to an oncologist for an assessment. Um, initial testing probably would include um, an additional pelvic exam, ultrasound, possibly a uh, CT that looks at the upper abdomen and chest, um, as well as maybe a CA-125 level. Um, this patient's CA-125 was elevated and a suspicious area in the adnexa, uh, suggestive of an adnexal mass was noted. Um, surgery was recommended, and um, at the time of surgery, an um, a fallopian tube cancer was identified, which was uh, early stage, stage 2B, um, more involving the pelvis and certainly not the upper abdomen. So in this case, uh, this was a um, somewhat of a uh, success in that uh, the patient's cancer was caught earlier than the typical stage three and four disease that we would normally see today uh, for ovarian or fallopian tube cancer. Yeah, I think that really illustrates the potential power of MSED. So let's talk about our second case, a woman preparing for standard cancer screening. She's 59. She was screened for colon cancer with col colonoscopy 10 years ago, and that was negative and she's now presenting for routine OBGYN care, what would you recommend for her? So she would have her routine gynecologic evaluation, including pelvic exam and whether she is uh, appropriate for uh, pap smear and mammography. But uh, regarding her colon cancer screening, um, Number one, um, I would want to make sure that uh, her screening 10 years ago was um, essentially normal and make sure she didn't have any polyps that needed to be followed up on. Uh, but she's essentially due for another colonoscopy at this time. And um, my recommendation probably would be 
to send her back for a colonoscopy at a minimum uh, DNA test or even a fecal occult uh, um, uh, blood test should be offered to the patient in the office. Um, and uh, I assume this patient has had a, a colonoscopy previously and may have a provider that's going to easily offer that to her. Uh, but again, as we know, people are sometimes reluctant to go through those procedures as they, they find it to be invasive. Uh, but part of my job as an OBGYN is to encourage that patient to go get that screening test done. Um, so colonoscopy should be encouraged every 10 years. Our um, start age is 45. And, um, um, you know, typically, as I mentioned, we use the fecal occult blood test. We have the stool DNA test. We have the CT virtual colonoscopy or colonography or um, uh, an actual physical colonoscopy. Uh, the frequency changes depending on what test we use and what findings we have on colonoscopy. But here is another opportunity where MSET testing can be offered along with our standard screening approach to a patient um, who is, um, you know, either due for that colonoscopy or ambivalent about wanting to go through with it or not and has questions. So we could use it as an adjunct uh, test here. Yeah, I would emphasize that the colonoscopy is the correct answer for this particular patient to start with. That's the established way we screen for colon cancer. But if she were interested in being screened for other cancers, MSED um, could certainly be offered. And so she had her colonoscopy and she had the MSET and both were negative. So she should go back into the regular screening pool then and be screened at the appropriate uh, intervals for uh, breast cancer and uh, colon cancer. And if she decides she wanted um, another MSED test in the future, she certainly could have one. Um, so let me just conclude with some final thoughts. And I think I said this earlier, you know, we do screen for five cancers in the United States. And we do that because they reduce mortality. That's been shown without any question. But despite the fact that we screen for these five common cancers, we still lose more than 600,000 patients a year. And again, the reason is that those five tests work well for the cancers they screen for, but people die mostly of other cancers that aren't screened for. So MSEDs and liquid biopsy have the potential to fill that gap and to increase not only the early detection of cancer, but actually increase the number of cancers that are detected. And we haven't emphasized this, but because of the improved positive predictive value of MSEDs over standard screening, screening becomes far more efficient at a population level. So we've modeled that early detection using MSEDs that lead to earlier diagnosis and potentially curative treatment could reduce cancer mortality in the United States by about 25% using the current technology. So I wanna thank you all for uh, joining us and I'll leave the final take homes to Mark to put this in context for your particular practice. Thank you, Eric. So as an OBGYN, we clearly have an opportunity to offer screening and review with our patients the current recommendations. We need to encourage our patients to comply with our routine screening which at this time includes pap smears, mammography, as well as colonoscopy. But we also have a potential opportunity to integrate uh, some of these MSET screenings into settings, such as when our patients have concern about ovarian cancer or other malignancies that they're concerned about, where we don't have any current standard screening uh, criteria. And um, really, uh, for me, that concludes our exploration of cancer screening, the role of MSET uh, screening technologies, and the role that an OBGYN plays in applying these new strategies for improving cancer screening protocols and ultimately patients' lives. Um, I hope you have found uh, this information informative and useful for your practice. Thank you for allowing me to participate in this program. Thank you, Mark, and my thanks to the audience for joining us. I hope you found this useful. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash EQC 860.
This activity is supported by an educational grant from Grail Incorporated.